Welcome to this edition of Campus Conversations. My name is Dan Mogolov. I'm from the Campus Office of Communications and Public Affairs, and totally pleased and honored to have Chris Treadway with us today. As usual, a brief, uh, brief introduction. Chris will have a few comments about what she and her office are up to now. Then I have a few questions. And then as we go, if you have questions, write them on the index cards, hold them up in the air, and we'll collect them. So Chris Treadway is the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Government and Community Relations here at UC Berkeley. As the Assistant Chancellor, she is responsible for developing and executing a comprehensive integrated government relations strategy that aligns with and supports the overall goals and vision of the campus. In her role, she serves as a political advisor to the chancellor and senior leadership and manages strategic relationships with elected officials, external advocates, and the UC regions. Chris has 30 years of experience in working in government and higher education. She started her career in Washington, D.C., working for the House Education Committee and the, post, and the subcommittee on post-secondary education. She then spent six years, she spent six years working in this role as a congressional staffer before escaping, I mean moving to San Francisco for a job in government relations at uh, San Francisco State University where she served as, an as the executive director of government relations there for 12 years. In, 20, in 2005, she wisely decided to move across the bay where she'd been living here since 97 and started at Berkeley as the Director of State Government Relations. Um, she then moved into a leadership role as Executive Director of the Office of Government and Community Relations. And in 2007, she became the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Government and Community Relations. And in 2013, finished her empire building in her current role as Assistant <laughs> Chancellor. So without further ado, Chris, a few words to set the table and then we'll Thank go you. from there. Thanks, Dan. Happy to be here. Unlike some of your more famous guests on the show, uh, some of you are probably not as familiar with the work of government and community relations. So I thought I would just talk a little bit about what our office does. Uh, we're, uh, we're, we're down to about an elite eight. So we're small, but we're mighty. Uh, small staff. But we, uh, the, the overall mission of our office is to demonstrate the value and importance of UC Berkeley in front of elected officials, government agencies, local community, and the general public. So a large part of what we do is building relationships. Of course, uh, the state is still our largest donor, despite some dis recent disinvestment, giving the campus about $300 million every year, 350. Uh, and the UC system about $3 billion a year. So they're a very key constituency for us. So we build a lot of relationships with them, educate them on what we do, find out issues of interest to them, and try to match up our experts uh, in order to help their agenda as well. So there's a lot of communications and messaging work that goes along with that. We work closely with the UC system on system-wide uh, strategies, and of course with our public affairs colleagues. Thank you very much for your support, guys, in telling our story uh, in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. We do a lot of uh, political advising to the senior leadership as they're making decisions, let them know what the political implications might be of those actions, we, and we deal a lot with public policy. We track legislation, follow issues, um, and engage our faculty directly with uh, policymakers at the state and federal level. A lot of this work is uh, frequent trips to Sacramento and Washington, D.C. In fact, we had our staff, I think, four or five trips to D.C. just this spring with uh, several deans and faculty members um, advising uh, congressional folks on artificial intelligence, water policy, ag and, and CNR issues. So sometimes we have major policy briefings that we hold for staff. Um, if staff are working on some, some big issue. You mean we, congressional staff. Congressional staff, legislative staff. Um, and then sometimes it's just we take faculty to meet one-on-one -on -one with legislators and members. And again, sometimes it's to advance our own interests in increased funding for their research. Or sometimes it's to advise a policymaker if they have a bill they're working on and want more information. Um, and then finally, I would say we're also kind of a complaint desk, or maybe a help desk would be a better way of, of phrasing that. We get a lot of inquiries from the legislature, from the public, um, UC uh, Office of the President. Um, but a lot of times, constituents will call their local uh, elected official and want help with an issue. And so they'll bring that to us. So we do a lot of you mean problem a solving. A university yeah. Issue? Mm -hmm. So, like, Univers what's an example of that? 
examples can be admissions questions or residency questions or financial aid problem or, you know. And so we're fixers. We try to sort of solve and navigate those problems. We work with a lot of our colleagues here to, to just uh, solve those issues as they come up. Um, and then we, uh, well, I thought maybe it'd be good to give you a little flavor of it's kind of the issues at, at all these levels. So I'll start off with the federal level where we're actively tracking, continue to track immigration, visa issues, DACA, uh, the Congress is starting a um, reauthorization of the Higher Education Act, which uh, sets the stage for all of the financial aid uh, issues for our students, so working on Pell Grants and those kinds of issues. And then we're ad actively advocating for increased funding for science. Uh, the President's budget in, uh, that was just introduced calls for a lot of major cuts to sciences. I think it's a billion dollars out of NSF, a billion dollars out of Department of Energy's Office of Science, uh, five billion from NIH, and seven billion out of Department of Education. So a lot of concerning um, cuts on the table there. Um, then at the state level, it's all about the state budget, primarily this season. Uh, the UC budget, uh, the bu governor's budget that got introduced ha was a good start for UC. I think um, we're looking forward to working with this governor. Um, but there are still a few issue, outstanding issues we're trying to get the legislature to include additional money for tuition buyout and make that permanent and some enrollment funding. The other major issue with the state is trying to get funding for capital. As you know, we have a significant deferred maintenance and seismic needs on our, on our campus. There is a bill that's been introduced um, for a general obligation bond to go on the 2020 ballot that the legislature is currently considering that provides about $8 billion between UC and CSU. So we're really hoping we can get some traction and get that passed this year. And at the local level, here's a lot going on at the local level. Um, I think the really good news here is that the chancellor and the mayor have had a, a great working relationship. As you know, they're working on a lot of issues of mutual interest, including the housing crisis and homelessness. And so the chancellor's um, student housing initiative that she announced, where we're trying to double the number of beds in the next 10 years, um, will require a lot of consultation with the community. There's about eight or 10 sites we're looking at to be developed in that process. We also just uh, announced the start of the long range development plan planning process, which will be about a two-year effort um, that will also require a lot of engagement with the community. But we have a ton of relationships with the community, not only in Berkeley, but Oakland, Richmond, Albany. Um, and so our staff uh, work closely with a lot of the educational partnerships that are going on uh, in the city. And we manage the Chancellor's Community Partnership Fund which is about $250,000 a year, basically in grants, 300 uh, in grants that we give out every year. And the, these are really meant to improve the quality of life for the Berkeley um, community, citizens of Berkeley. And so we have, the, we have nonprofits partner with the university on these projects, and they support everything from education projects, arts and culture, community safety, environmental stewardship, things like that. I think we've spent about two million, three million in the last 12 years of this fund. So it's been a great way to interact with the community. And if you want more information about all of these activities we do with the community and, and our work in general, subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, it is a, comes out every week. Our fabulous Jen Loy uh, edits that and um, it'll give you the full scoop on what we're up to. Got it, so I actually want to start with a personal question. So I think you have politics in your family background. You've been in the po political game for a long time. And I know we all have some pretty passionate opinions about the political world now. Mm -hmm. But what, brought, what attracted you then? And do you think the game has changed over the years since you first went, went to work on the Hill? Well, I actually got into politics when I was in Montana. I come from a rural background, uh, moved around a bit because my father was in higher education. But I was living in eastern Oregon in a town of 12,000 people and uh, went to college actually in Montana and started as a music major. Um, and from there, I got interested actually in the US-Soviet policy issues mm. that were going on at the time. 
the arms race. And uh, I spent a year at the University of Maryland studying the US-Soviet relationship. And while I was there, I, I interned in Washington, DC. And so I met the congressman from Montana. And then by the time I graduated, he asked me to come and, and work for him in, in Washington. So that was pretty terrific. And while I was working for him, I met his son, who turned out to be my husband. So <laughs> uh, long story short there. So, uh, so we're very involved, yes. And then um, he served in the Congress for 20 years. And then his wife was actually the first Senate Majority Leader in the state of Montana. Wow. She went into politics when he retired and came to Montana. So, so it's in the blood. It's in the blood. It's a, so what do you like blood. about it? And has it, has it all changed? Oh, it's changed a lot. Um, wow. When I first went to Washington, there was a lot of collaboration between Democrats and Republicans. This was in the late 80s, and it was very collegial. Um, while there would be disagreements, um, staff would usually just get together, and over pizza, we would hammer out di differences in conference bills and work it out. And so there was a lot more collegiality. You would see the members getting together, even spending time with each other, um, out to dinner together, arch enemies out to dinner. Um, and then I think it started to shift in 96 with the Republican revolution um, and take over the House. And it started to get a lot more um, political. And even committees like mine, which were very much policy-based, where you would just sit down and work out the details of the policy you were trying to do, turned into pol more political conversations. And so, so the environment there is, is extremely heightened politically and divided. So. so how do you think that politicization is impacting, at least in Washington, higher education issues? Have we become a political football, meaning the whole sector? How is that affecting us, do you think? Well, I think there's definitely a, a tendency towards thinking universities are elite and that they are sort of a liberal bastion, uh, more and more and more becoming, I, I think, perceived as, an, as elite institutions. And um, an interesting thing that some of the Pew, the Pew um, Center has done some polling between Republicans and Democrats and what, how do they feel about higher education, and it's pretty different. Um, and the messaging that universities are using, even around scientific issues, we are starting to use different phrases. Instead of, um, instead of uh, uh, climate research, you can, you can talk about it, impact on agriculture or natural resources, or um, you know, they like the term health research more and medical research that is really tied directly to people's concerns. And so I, I think that, that there is a crisis in the perceived cost of education, the lack of access, and some of the elite mentality. We'll come back to the federal level. I want to um, jump over to Sacramento for a second. Um, and I know you have to be really diplomatic, but lean in as much as you can. Um, so the last governor was known to have a complicated relationship with the UC, let's yeah. say. What's, what's it looking like with the new governor? What are you sensing and hearing from the new administration and how does it bode for us? Right. Well, I wanna, uh, seriously, our, our role is, is to be nonpartisan, but uh, I will have to say that I personally think that this Governor Jerry Brown was actually very good for the state of California. He came in in a terrible time. I think the state was facing $27 billion deficit and he came along and really applied this fiscal conservative conservatism to his job, and he was very successful in turn in had a, a large role, I think, in in turning the economy around. Um, and he ended up with projected 15 billion dollar surplus. The rainy day fund, I think, is 14 billion, 15 billion now. So um, he really held people's feet to the fire to be to be um, you know very. Uh, conservative with the spending, which I think was important. And of course, he really left a legacy of climate change, and he, he really did a lot for the working poor, inequality issues. Mm -hmm. So I think, generally speaking, he was terrific for California. It's no secret that he had issues with uh, UC. And uh, some of that, I think, really was in his philosophy. He, he rejected, bristled at the idea of excellence, um, and and but really also didn't elitism, like right? elitism yeah. exactly, and did not appreciate us always saying we had to compete with Stanford and Harvard, and and so he wanted us to just be good enough for California, 
Um, and so, you know, the, there were it was some challenges there um, with him. But I think that, you know, overall, it came down to him him wanting to be um, more fiscally conservative. And I will say one of the toughest things for us was probably the holding tuition flat for six years. And that had, I think, a, a great impact and um, maybe more than he fully realized. Yeah. And Governor Newsom, so what, what are we hearing? What are you sensing? What's the prognosis? He has a bold agenda. Um, I will say that he's done um, great in hiring a lot of really, really smart, wonderful people in the administration. And he's setting a, he's charting a really, really impressive course for the future um, with, you know, expanding health care and universal preschool and wanting to have more access for early childhood education, the housing crisis and homelessness he wants to tackle. So those are big price tag items. I think he even wants to have two years of free community college. So he's, he's putting a lot of bold ideas out there, and we'll just have to see if the, if the state coffers can, can handle that. I don't know, I'm just getting word that the, uh, that the revenues from, from taxes aren't quite up to par yet, but we're hoping in the next week or so that that, that will get raised. So, But we're hopeful. He's, we're excited. So even as we're talking, a few questions came in directly related to this, mm -hmm. and I think what people really want to know, and I'm going to push you on here okay. a little bit, so when I talk about prognosis, not to beat around the bush, but talking about the possibility of a return to the good old days, or at least a step back towards a different sort of partnership and financial support for the UC, how do you think that might play out and what do our current efforts look like to support advocacy to increase funding? Uh, well, I'm very hopeful, actually, because I think that, uh, again, the Governor Newsom really, uh, I think, understands and appreciates the research mission of UC. And I think he can understand the differences between what UC does and the role of CSU, for example. So I know he has a, a lot of interest in several research areas uh, of the university. I think he understands the economic impact that, that the UC has on the state, which is extremely impressive and significant. So, and I, and I feel like the relationships in Sacramento have, are getting better. The campuses are spending a lot of time up there with alumni and students. Lots of, of advocacy efforts have been underway. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty hopeful that we're gonna get to a place where we can have uh, a more increased funding for UC. I think there's gonna have to be a deal with the legislature and the governor's office clearly about uh, issues of affordability and access, and there are a lot of concerns about the large numbers of non-resident students that have been coming in in recent years, which was in a direct response to the budget cuts. Um, so, but I think that they will have there will be some progress made on this. At least I'm hopeful. So maybe you could unpack something for us. I mean, something I've always wondered about. A whole number of studies show that states get back anywhere to four to seven dollars for every dollar they put into higher ed, which makes it seem like a no-brainer. Why, has, why is increased funding for higher education, whether the UCs and or the CSUs, why is that not a no-brainer in Sacramento? Why is that something that's been tough to achieve in recent years, given the substantiated benefits of investments in higher education? It's a great question. Uh, we ask our legislators this often, and if you poll most Californians, they, they put education yeah. at the top of the list for their priorities. I think in California, you know, the, the budget, the discretionary budget is quite constrained. And so there are a lot of competing interests. And what ends up happening is, you know, healthcare is a big priority, prison funding uh, competes with the UCs, unfortunately, and so there's a pretty small piece of the pie that this discretionary money can support. And, and I think that for a long time, uh, as, the, as the budget, we were in the heat of budget crises, the legislature felt like the universities have the ability to raise taxes, uh, unlike what they could do on, on um, Californians, through increased tuition, through philanthropy, through you know, bringing in more non-residents and that, and that helped us for a while, and that was other sources of funding. But we sort of hit a tipping point, um, I think, with that, and, and the amount of money that we're charging non-resident students has, has reached an all-time high. So people are starting to say, okay, now maybe we need to shift this balance back a little more. So I think there's a recognition that they do want to 
invest in UC and CSU, but it's all about access and affordability and that we need to produce something like a, a million more degrees over the next 10 years in the state. And are there still concerns in Sacramento about the extent to which the UC as a whole is a good steward of the resources it's provided with? I mean, shortly after you and I started here on campus, there was the whole, what was called the co compensation scandal. Is that a gift that keeps on giving or taking, I should say? Like in the private moments that when legislators lean over the table and say, Chris, I'd love to support you, but. Yeah. What are, what, what are they <laughs> oogy about up there? Um, so thankfully, I think the executive compensation issue is not as a hot a topic um, these days, at least with most of the members we talk to. Uh, I think um, that issue is, is, was problematic, but I, I think for the most part, people understand that the university has a lot of sources of funding and, and we need to attract the best and brightest in order to, you know, make new inventions and new new uh, discoveries in healthcare and, and how much we give back to the economy in that respect. The, uh, the main issue is really uh, about the concerns over non-residents at the moment. And I, and I feel like the, the UC, the trust in UC is getting better. I mean, it, we're pretty transparent. Everything's up on the web. It's, you know, it's open information. We're a public institution. We have many, many, many public records requests for information. So I, I think uh, the legislators are, are willing to make the investment. It's just, it's a matter of competing resources for the most part. So don't take this the wrong way, but why do we have a state relations office? As, whether do we have, does Berkeley have separate business from the rest of the UC? When we go there, are we advocating for Berkeley specific things? In other words, why is it not just the UC system as a whole? Right. What do you guys carve out? Good question. So let me step back for a minute. Um, in Before term limits were enacted, hmm. the, for years the university system had a very close relationship with legislators, the Willie Brown days and you know, long standing members up there were there for years and years. And so the university had really close uh, ties up there. Once term limits came into effect and there were more and more legislators um, brand new to the, to the job, uh, we started having several years where a third of the legislature would be brand new people and turning over. So there was a much greater need to start educating those folks and that was really where we started to see some of the growth in government relations offices where there was a need for more people to be interacting with them. So campuses in the UC have always tended to have some kind of government relations presence. Um, and it really is about advancing the interests of the UC. When we go up there on budget issues, it's, we speak with one voice because it, there is one line item to the university. Um, but we tell them what the impact is for our campus. And we have lots of researchers, again, who have um, projects they're doing with state agencies or they may be expert in an issue that will help legislators. And so we, we give them access to that. Yeah. So another question came in and something you and I have talked about also. What opportunities and do staff, faculty, you've talked about a little bit, and students have? I mean, do you bring staff and students up to Sacramento? Does that make a difference? Is this something where broader engagement helps our cause? Talk to us a little bit about, explain what we do and how that all works. Yeah, so our, our advocacy efforts have sort of ebbed and flowed throughout the years. Um, depending on the issue, I would say, when we were facing the billion dollars in budget cuts, we... Um, we you mean the system the as system a whole? The system had, yeah, a billion as a whole. I mean, um, Berkeley, our funding was cut in half, essentially. I think we were about 500 million, went down to about 250. Um, so we had a very aggressive advocacy effort in those days where we did involve um, a lot of external alumni, but also staff and, and students in, in lobbying or advocating um, on our behalf. Uh, we tend to be pretty directed because we're a small office. We try to be targeted in our efforts so that we can approach the right people with the right message at the right time rather than bombard people. In the old days, you kind of used to send in postcards, you know, and you'd get 10,000 postcards sent to a legislator on an issue. And uh, honestly, I think the, these members are much more sophisticated now about how they interact with their constituents and, and so bringing the people in that can answer their questions um, 
I think builds the best relationships for them. But we obviously always welcome people to go to their local district offices and know their legislators and let them know that you support UC. And it's a pretty broad message. I think everyone always says to me, what should our messages be? What is UC really trying to do? And at, at the end of the day, it's tell your story. Tell them why you care about UC and why it should be supported, because that resonates the most with them. So I'm, I'm just wondering, sometimes I hear from alumni and others and say, you know, you guys only get 12% of your budget from the state. It's not, just go private. Or I mean, oh, it's crazy, but yeah. um, is it worth it? What's your response to people who say, look, we put up with so much, they would say, mm -hmm. and we only get 12%. What's the pushback? What's the response to that? Well, first of all, we're a public institution that was founded um, by the public, and so we uh, and we're a state entity. So our buildings are state owned, and we're state employees. and And so, even though we may not get a majority of our funding from the state, um, they, we have a public interest. So I think becoming private would be a real challenge because there, there's a lot of a lot investment of here that they assets that they own. So that would be a trick. Um, but I, and I know I think there's there's frustration sometimes with, with the amount of oversight and overreach. We really are governed by the the UC Regents, and they have constitutional autonomy. But because of the relationship to the budget, we try to be as responsive as we can to the legislature. Uh, the autonomy is really set up to prevent political persuasion uh, on the university, and so that way they could preserve academic freedom. And so for the most part, all of that I think is is still intact. But, um, but you know, if the legislature is giving us $300 million a year, I would think they, you know, can tell us kind of what way they want us to do with it, <laughs> yeah, that would seem generally to, speaking. Yeah, that would yeah. seem to buy some influence. Yeah. Um, in terms of the agenda, another question came in, and, and that has to do with whether the campus is advocating in the Capitol for money for student housing or for new development. And this is something we hear a lot about, that we don't have debt capacity or the state's not in the game anymore in terms of providing funds for capital projects. Is that part of our agenda? And what's that situation in terms of not so much the operating budget, but access to capital for construction? Right, so uh, that's another very fascinating um, question. The state used to fund, about, they, they now are providing only about a tenth of the capital that they used to fund for the university. Um, we have not had a general obligation bond since 2006 on the ballot. And general obligation bonds were used to finance to construction? To finance construction for, for new buildings. Because of the campus's recent budget problem, difficulties with our structural budget deficit, we did not have very much access to capital um, to issue our own debt. But because we've now balanced our books, there is some indication from Office of the President that we, we will maybe be able to use some of our funding for particularly student housing. We've been exploring public-private partnership models to also build housing and, and um, provide other, other needs on the campus. So the capital funding, we really need to try to get through a general obligation bond because the state just doesn't have the resources to support that any longer. Right. Think any chance of that may change in the future? Here too, like a return to the good old days in that sense? I doubt it for capital. I mean, I think the governor's proposed $138 million just for, for deferred maintenance to just help us keep pace with the existing buildings and the upkeep. And of course, Berkeley has a very significant deferred maintenance and seismic issues on our campus. So uh, we have a lot of need there. Um, but so without a, a, a general obligation bond, I don't see that there's there's just not that much one-time money available to be able to address that need. So a couple more questions about Sacramento, then we'll move into the town gown, and maybe if we're feeling really brave, talk a little bit more about Washington. Um, I'm just curious, you, you take the chancellor to Sacramento on a regular basis, and I think those of us who've heard her speak know that she has pretty extraordinary communication skills. Does that make a difference? Has, has her engagement, do you think, had any impact on the way our campus is seen and the extent to which we're meeting some of our objectives up there? Absolutely. Uh, Chancellor Christ um, has been amazing in, in all of her political engagement. And she really did make it a priority to be engaged locally and to be engaged with the state legislature. Uh, she hasn't done as much engagement federally, but, but she really wanted to focus on trying to get increased funding from the state, and, and it's definitely noticed. Um, their chancellor's 
you know, have been going to Sacramento, I think, more frequently. But we, uh, we get a lot of response from staff and from legislators telling us how much they appreciate having the chancellor's face up there. It, it demonstrates the commitment of the campus and that she's really spending the time and she spends a lot of time there. So it's paying off and, she's, and she hosts people here. We have a lot of legislators that come to campus and she's hosted them um, a number of times. We have had a member here yesterday, Senator, um, who came to campus. So there's a, there's a frequent interaction, but it makes a difference. Are you gonna see the governor here? Uh, I would hope so, yes, hopefully we will. Um, a lot of his staff have been coming through, and so I'm sure well, that... Well, one of them is an alum, decide. right? Joey's a... Uh... Joey Freeman is one of his senior legislative staff. Um, Ann O'Leary is his chief of staff, is also an alum. I mean, there's a, there's a, a lot of them, so it's, it's great. I think we have um, at least 150 staff, legislative staff, who are alums in the legislature. Cool. We have the most members who are alumni, actually with 15 members, so... Yeah, even more than UCLA or anyone else. All right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're going to turn to town gown, but just to okay. remind if folks have questions now that have come to mind and, uh, once we started talking, again, fill out your cards, hold them up, and we'll, we'll scoop them up as we go. So let's turn to town gown. I, a lot of people here, as the chancellor was signaling um, her intentions to develop People's Park, just it was like, oh my God, she's grabbing the third rail, it's Armageddon, it's gonna be a disaster. And the announcement was made and uh, not that much, I mean, you know, some opposition, but very different than what people anticipated. What do you think's happening in, what does that say about what's happening in, the t in town, in terms of the town gown relationship, in terms of the relationship with the mayor, sort of, kind of weigh in on that whole phenomenon that I think surprised a lot of longtime residents here. Wow, you just went right for it. Um, <laughs> yeah, People's Park. Uh, I, I was surprised somewhat also uh, that it's been difficult to get leadership here to want to take that on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a, we've been talking about it for many years and the need to really clean it up. Um, because it's not the best use of, of the space, frankly, um, and we've had a lot of a lot of difficult issues around the park. Um, so I was thrilled when the chancellor said that she thought this was the time to take it on, and and it it really is the urgency of the moment in needing to have more housing, and and this, that the city embraced that with us as well. I think one of the biggest reasons why this has been, at least so far, um, people are not. Uh, you know, protesting in the streets about it, not yet, um, is that the chancellor really made a strong commitment to address the issue of, how, of homelessness. And so she actually um, hired someone, a social worker, to be in the park and partnered with the city on trying to figure out how we can solve this problem together rather than just, okay, we're going to fence it and, and off we go. And so making that commitment to have um, supportive housing on site for long-term homeless and some kind of a memorial to the park. We won't forget its history, um, but I think that's been key to why we've had the response thus far. So that's an area where the city and the, and the campus seem to be collaborating effectively. What do you think are some of the existing or perhaps future potential friction points? Because obviously our, in, our interests and our objectives are not identical. Um, and I think that's true for every university and every ho you know, town w within which they're situated. So what do you see, what's on the horizon? What are the issues that your office is sort of looking at right now to get ahead of that curve? Yes, great point. Um, I mean, historically, town gown campuses that, that are like it, located in big cities um, have this natural tension of what the impact of the campus is on the local community. <laughs> Um, as many of you may know, we did have a lawsuit with the city the last time we went through our long-range development uh, planning process, and so, you know, we could have another lawsuit this time. I think that the campus has significantly grown in population, um, but, but we have, have done a lot of work to mitigate many of those impacts. So even on the things like the carbon footprint or transportation and parking issues, we've tried very hard and, and I think have actually have some recent data that shows that our impact is not what we thought it would be even 15 years ago. So I mean, it's less than what it's we less than what we thought initially. Um, and so even though the population has grown, I think that there will be conversations about uh, other impacts that are not recognized as part of the formal CEQA process, 
which is what, um, what we have to comply with. Um, but I think the converse, having these conversations with the city now is really what the chancellor's been trying to do and, and outreach with the mayor's office to understand community's concerns, find areas where we can collaborate and partner, and, and try to address those up front this time. I mean, again, it's a long process. We'll be taking a lot of feedback from the community, but um, this chancellor has been ready and willing to have those conversations. Hmm. Um, let's move into Washington, D.C. for just a little bit. Um, how have things changed in this administration? I, I don't want to start a whole political conversation here, but came in with stated intentions to cut federal support for research. And I know there was a lot of concern across the higher education sector. That seems not to have played out as per the administration's initial statements, or maybe it has, or maybe it's just an abeyance. What, from a higher education and UC Berkeley perspective, well, what's happened in Washington in the last couple of years? So, um, yes, the president's budget, um, like it has just been announced recently, uh, proposed lots of cuts, and the Congress, uh, for the most part, walked those cuts back, even things like uh, the National Endowment for the Arts was on the chopping block and, and that got walked back. I think that, um, you know, the reality for us is that we have very strong coalitions that we work with nationally to advocate for things like science and tech policy and financial aid obviously is, a, is an issue that we, we have a lot of folks that will weigh in and, and advocate heavily for. So the, the reality of the day to day is that when, when we hear about things being proposed, we send lots of folks up to make our case and again, work with the National Association to put out our messages and just work those members um, one at a time. We, we try to partner with uh, higher education institutions in red states, for example, and go to those members who are on key committees um, to make our case. And so for the most part, I think, you know, other than this most recent round of pretty significant cuts to the science budgets, you know, we've, we've been okay. I think the, the Higher Education Act, if, it, if they move forward on that reauthorization, will be interesting um, given the dynamic where they're always trying to make some modifications with student aid um, issues will be, will be something we'll have to really pay attention to. Um, and of course, you know, we, we hoped the DREAM Act would get uh, enacted and, and that continues to be something where pretty bipartisan, there was a lot of bipartisan support for that. And so we're hoping that, that that can continue to be possible. Do you see Congress continuing to be a counterbalance to perhaps some of the administration's desires? Is that oh, gonna, definitely, yeah. yeah. And with the, with, the, um, with the Democrats now in control of the House, uh, that's, that's obviously going to shift the dynamic here. Um, it's hard to say. It sounds like there are certainly a lot of Democrats who really want to continue down this sort of investigations path of the president. Um, some even talking about impeachment, but Nancy Pelosi's been cl pretty clear about how she doesn't, doesn't want to go down that path. So uh, it's hard to see. I would imagine that we're going to be back to gridlock uh, again on, on a lot of issues. Um, but there are, there, are, there are ways to come together with the Republican leadership to, again, I think advance issues of um, importance to the country, particularly in in scientific innovation that we can come together on those. Yep. A couple of questions um, on a related front. So this one is, um, and I think you answered the first part, does your office engage in lobbying for increased federal funding? That the second part here is how can centers, and I'm assuming research centers and institutes on campus and individuals be involved with that advocacy? And also asking how your office works with the vice chancellor research's office that also engages with Washington. So how can sort of how can all of us be involved? Is there some role? And also how do you integrate in your efforts with other parts of the campus that have a big skin in the game in the federal game? Right. So first of all, uh, technically we don't lobby. Um, we're not registered federal lobbyists. Um, our campus uh, and, there, and there is a slight difference. We advocate um, on behalf of the campus for increased funding, mm -hmm. but we don't um, our campus does not take a position on a bill or you know that the way um, traditional lobbying works. So it's very similar, but we call it advocacy. Um, our office works very closely with the Vice Chancellor for Research um, on connecting with agencies to increase funding and also to work with faculty who want to visit the Hill, for example. 
So centers, people who, who want to advocate for increased funding for their projects, our, our office works very closely with them. We, because we're small, we have, uh, we sort of sit down with folks and talk through what they really need, what the, what the like, uh, likelihood of success would be for what they're asking for and kind of do a little bit of a political matrix of assessment around what they're asking for. Um, but generally speaking, we're here to help. We're here to help them connect. Even if we don't have bandwidth to take them ourselves, we can work with actually the office of uh, the UC's federal relations office in DC can often jump in and help uh, to staff people or give them information, help connect them on the Hill. So we're, we're here as a resource and um, and frequently do take people around and, and help them get funding. So another one from the audience here. Can you elaborate on your current policy or advocacy efforts um, on immigration I issues for international students, scholars, or faculty staff, and also DACA? Uh, this person is interested in your or your office's current priorities for these groups. And again, um, I understand these groups to be um, dreamers, as they're called, international students, scholars, and employees in, in, around immigration. So that's a big field, but maybe are, are you involved, is your office involved with this? Is the UC, what are we doing? UC is very involved. It's, it's been at the top of their priority list for some years. Um, our office is also very involved. Again, we, we have been educating our legislators about the needs of our DACA students the importance of our international community and our international students. We work closely with uh, congressional folks, often on visa issues, when we have people in our community who are having uh, problems with their visa. So we provide a lot of information. We do advocate for these bills uh, on a regular basis. And um, so, yeah, we're very engaged in it, and it continues to be a top priority of UC overall. The other, another federal question, it's a good one, is, um, Sort of a question of, is it become harder to advocate for just sort of basic research? Um, and they're interested in the language you might use when you argue for basic research. Yes, this is one of the issues that I was alluding to between the Democrats and the Republicans yeah. and how they view basic research. Um, the data shows that the Republicans don't respond as well to basic research, but they do respond to medical research or health research. So um, we take the lead again from Vice Chancellor for Research on, on what their top priorities are for us. It guides the, the kind of issues and efforts that we get involved in um, on that side of things. But yes, the language does matter. And yes, we tailor our messages to different audiences because we want to you know, educate them about what this means for them, no matter where they fall on the political spectrum, because we think it is important for everyone to support this kind of activity. And here's a more targeted question. Um, it says, can you address um, whatever you might be doing around cannabis or CBD research <laughs> and the extent to which we might be seeking or, uh, or be interested in federal state funding? The, this person says it seems like a significant part of the California economy right now. Um, so anything like that on your radar? You know, uh, the issue has come up. I believe we do have cannabis research uh, going on on our campus. Uh, it hasn't something, been something that my, I've directly been involved in. Maybe my staff have, have had some connections with them um, to, to educate our legislators about what we're doing with cannabis research is probably the extent of it at the moment Got it. that I know of. But I haven't been intimately involved with that. So. Got it. Um, we're going to swing back to the, to the state side for um, what are probably the last few questions here. This is an interesting question. Um, do you think there's any chance that Proposition 209, and that's the proposition for those of you who don't know, precludes uh, the campus from looking at um, ethnicity, um, among other things, when it comes to admissions, and I think hiring practices as well. So this person asked, do you think there's any chance that Prop 209 might ever get reversed? <sighs> That's an interesting question. Um, I would say there were about uh, maybe five or six years ago, there, was, there were a lot of efforts around this. Um, working with different constituencies to really push to get this overturned. I think the reality of how UC does admissions right now, um, most of the other campuses have, have followed Berkeley's lead in doing 
uh, this very comprehensive approach to admissions where we don't just look at one thing and, and it's a holistic approach. I think we have 14 criteria we look at. And so we're, we're really kind of, kind of moving away from that, uh, that mentality, uh, I think. And so I, I feel like the admissions, we're gonna have a lot of scrutiny on admissions process given the whole admissions scandal. Um, going on, and so we have state audits happening, we have our own internal audits happening, there's legislation, so there's gonna be a lot of oversight over our admissions policy, but I think it's pretty solid right now in that it, it, it includes a lot of different factors, not just race. Yeah. Um, we're only gonna have time for a few more, so I see some people who are writing on cards. We probably won't be able to get to it because we only have a few more minutes, but we'll try. Um, sorry, just for a second, this one. So I'm gonna hop back to the federal side. Actually, I meant to ask it before. And the, this person is asking about your office's involvement in the whole foreign influence in, in research conversation. For those of you who may not be aware, we have a, had a lot of interaction with federal agencies about for, um, support or contributions from foreign companies, particularly China. and. Scholars from China and faculty who are involved in China. There are there's a lot of energy around that right now, um, and so this person is asking. There, this person notes the Devar uh, Department of Energy uh, uh, recently released memos potentially restricting um, researchers receiving funds. Uh, I guess this has to do with, uh, again, uh, interactions or collaborations with China or with Chinese research or Chinese entities. What's going on with that? What's the, how do you take, how would you assess the situation? Are we, is it peaking? Is there more to come? And how, and what, what kind of involvement does your office have? So there is a lot of, um, of work being done on this in Washington. There are, I think, at least eight congressional committees between the House and the Senate wow. looking at um, the issues around foreign influence. Um, it continues to be a, a topic of great interest to them. Um, there are, I think, inquiries going on even with the National Science Foundation, NIH, around existing grants, um, and they're, they're reaching into universities and asking all sorts of questions. Um, our campus is part of a pilot project with Department of Defense looking, looking into some of these issues and how we can balance the federal oversight with privacy issues and um, for our researchers and our students and faculty. Um, so it's, it's a hot topic. We're engaged, again, with the UC system on this. The UC system had two different tiger teams on internationalization and foreign influence looking at these, and there is a, there is a committee on our campus uh, co-chaired by Randy Katz and, and Lisa Alvarez-Cohen who are looking at, at all the implications for our campus. So yes, we're engaged in it, and it'll be, I think, going on for, for some time. So what's the university stance? Is it like, nah, there's nothing to worry about here. This is just another red scare, or oh my god, yes, we're freaking out, or somewhere in the middle, there's some legitimacy to these concerns. What's, what's our stance as the, as the UC or Berkeley, however you, however you want to put it about all this? Well, we're taking it very seriously. I mean, there were, there were indictments around the Huawei um, uh, partnerships, and so uh, Vice Chancellor Katz has, has been actively involved in that and, and stopped our, our current engagements with Huawei. Actually, future. A future, yes, future. right, yeah. suspended future, thank you. Um, so it's, it's, it's not a nothing and it's not hair and fire. I think we're, we're walking this line of how we need to be responsive clearly to the, to the government's interests, but also um, be responsive to our faculty and our researchers and our students who come from other countries and have a right to be here. So here's another interesting question. You mentioned in the beginning that you had a small, the elite eight, but somebody asked a good question. So if you had more people, would it help? I mean, mm. what, what's, what's, yes. no. <laughs> who got paid off here? Right. Um, I mean, in other words, if you had more people, what, what, what else would you be doing if you could? What, what there is being, is being left unaddressed? It's being left unaddressed. Well, uh, Look, what we have to do with a smaller team is just scale back the, uh, the amount of, of work that we can do on any topic. I mean, we tend to be uh, people who have to deal with a lot of different things, and so we, we're kind of a mile wide and an inch deep, although we build up expertise in particular issues as needed. Um, 
But there's so much going on at the federal government and at the state government Sounds that, way. Uh, that, I mean, let's just take local, just given what we have on our plate for this housing strategy and all the work with the community. We used to have four uh, people in our office doing uh, community relations and we now have two or one and a half or two. Um, so it's, it's just limits the amount of effort that you can, that you can give to these issues. And, and it's a lot, a lot to juggle. So I think we could, we could be advancing more of our interests, particularly in Washington and in the state and in locally if we had more. So this is going to lead to what is the last question. And you addressed it partially before, but I really want to come back to it because mm -hmm. it's something that I think we hear a lot, and particularly in the context of the fact that perhaps you don't have the size staff that in a perfect world you might have. And the question is, what kind of institutional mechanisms or support can students leverage to get involved? And, and I just to really talk about that student angle, besides just writing to their congressman, are, are there effective, beneficial avenues that students who want to advocate and get engaged can, can, you know, can access? So first of all, I'll just do a quick pitch for UCAN, which is the UC's advocacy network. Everybody can sign up for that. The, the notifications and the work that, that's done through the UCAN network gives people a lot of information about what's going on, tells you ways you can get involved. From our office's perspective, we partner with students and student leadership in particular to not just send letters or make phone calls, but we engage with them in actually visiting legislators' offices. The chancellor has actually brought students with her on her visits to the Capitol. And so we, they're an important voice. And we, we just had our um, UC Berkeley Day in Sacramento um, where we brought uh, two different teams with alumni and, and the chancellor and a regent as well as students. So we try to include them because they are a critical voice for us. So. Super. Yeah. So before I thank Chris formally, just to note that um, the next campus conversation will be on May 13th with none other than Chancellor Chris and Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost Paul Alavisados. And that'll be in here. Oh, we're going to have it here. So look forward to seeing all of you then. And otherwise, Chris, I want to thank you for walking that tightrope really, really well today Hi. and for all okay. the work that you guys do. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thanks for having me.